All right, we're back in another Sound the Battle Cry. And this message is about shocking truth, shocking red pills from 15 years ago. Actually, 17 years ago. Uh, it's over 15 years ago. And just let me give you an explanation about what this is. Uh, I was red pilled at a very young age, uh, overdosed on red pills. I mean, a lot of truth I discovered. Uh, I had a penchant, an addiction to research, and all I would do is research. Uh, once I opened up that door, that Pandora's box, I would, I wouldn't even, you know, I get out of work and I wouldn't even watch movies. I just watch a new documentary, a new uh, lecture, or something like that. I would read books, articles over and over again. This is all I would do. And uh, also before that, I was, uh, you know, I started being a metal singer when I was 15 years old, and then uh, so I was always writing. And then so after I started the super red pilling, I started uh, writing about this type of stuff. And now I just write things, maybe they turn into songs or not. Some of them actually became songs. But I actually discovered a lot of this writing that I had saved. And all of this was written between 2005, 2009. So quite a few years ago, uh, like I said, uh, all the way back in 2005 is really when it blew wide open. It actually started a little bit before that, just giving a little bit of an explanation as to how this happened. And then Because let me just tell you, before I get into that actually, let me just tell you where this is going to go. I'm going to show you some pretty crazy things that I wrote down that are uh, cover a wide variety of topics that describe you know what we've been going through as a world, as a country, if you're in America, especially um, all these past couple decades and then especially describing a world now and where we're headed to as well. And um, so there's some pretty crazy stuff and especially stay towards the ending because there's going to be some mind-blowing stuff, some stuff you might have never even heard even if you've done a lot of research. So I, I highly suggest you watch or listen all the way to the end. Uh, very, very important stuff, information. But anyways, just to give a little bit of a heads up before we dive into this notebook, this is a picture of a notebook I have. It says copyright 2005 at the bottom. Pretty funny. But uh, before we get into that, I have pictures of all the papers of my, my handwriting on there, which is very bad, but uh, it's got the information on it. But just a, just a quick little bit of a background. It actually started in high school. Before I even discovered any information, I just uh, started to recognize some things, some patterns, and some, um, some, I had some observations. And, um, you know, so what I, would, what I noticed is that, you know, nowadays they call people NPCs, who are just like, you know, just like everyone else, seems like they don't really think, and they just uh, mindlessly regurgitate things that they hear, repeat opinions that they hear in the, in the media and universities and what everyone else is saying, right? Mainstream society. Well, I started to notice that in high school. I didn't know that, you know, I didn't have a name for it. In fact, I came up with a name called the Tater Tots because uh, they all seem the same. Uh, some of you might know Tater Tots by the, the, the word uh, spud puppies. But anyways, they all look the same. What I noticed was in high school that um, it was like everybody would use the same phrases and terminology, but especially the biggest thing that I noticed was that people that got straight A's weren't exactly uh, the, uh, people that I viewed as being the most intelligent. But instead, what I noticed is that they got really good people. The people that got the best grades were those who had the ability to memorize what they read in a book and then regurgitate it word for word as the answer to questions on tests. And they always got good grades. All you had to do is repeat what it said word for word. No, uh, there was no coming up with your own opinion, no critical thinking, problem solving, these types of things. Just repeat, and the repeaters got the best grades. And I noticed that. And I was like, you know, I wasn't like that. I was different. I was weird. I was I was outcast. But um, but I also got along with a lot of different groups. But anyways, I said there's something weird about that. And then and then you know as time went on, I noticed more and more things. But then I started to get super red pilled when I started reading some books. Uh, David Icke book was one of them. Started watching Alex Jones documentaries. Then it went on from there. It went, it went way 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 beyond that. Tons of stuff. All right, and if and one more thing before I get into this, I promise it'll be that'll be the last thing I'll say for the intro, is that uh, back in the day, back in my day, we used to have Google Video. They actually shut that all down, um, and on Google Video, there were tons of conspiracy um, 
documentaries and lectures by people at different places and stuff and conspiracy events. So there was so much stuff that if you didn't download, got deleted. Some people re, you know, re-uploaded some things, but it was pretty crazy back in the day, in the early days of the internet. So anyways, without further ado, let's get into some of this information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read, go through some of these lyrics and these writings, and then I'll just kind of riff about what I was thinking about that, some of the information. And then, um, like I said, there'd be some crazy stuff at the end. So let's get into it. All right. Go to the first one. All right, here's the first one. Conditioned from birth to death to swallow lies. Repeatedly force-fed until they're memorized. The destruction of independent opinion through suppression of critical thinking. This is, you know, this is kind of like exactly what I was just talking about. So I was writing about this, you know, it's about like the public school system, uh, brainwashing, you know, from the entire time that you're in public school and then into college and these types of things. Um, they don't want an independent opinion. Uh, it, it, it repeats it over. And that's one of the things, repetition. You want to, to brainwash people, you need to use repetition, say the same things over and over and over again. And then they are taught how to repeat things to... Uh, to make sure that they've complied and it's just conditioning uh, suppress critical thinking yeah, exactly production of mechanized hive minds through standardized evaluations of progress uh, you know like the uh, SATs and other tests like that standardized tests uh, dissension silenced by defamation of character opportunities denied depending on willingness to comply this is like the cancel culture right uh, if you dissent, if you have a dissenting opinion, they will talk trash about you, defame you, lie about you, attack you, so that you stop um, going against the grain, the status quo, right? Opportunities denied. Yeah, you want that promotion, you want opp career opportunities. Well, that's going to get sw squashed if you have a, a uh, opinion outside of the norm. You got to comply. The biggest thing is complying, obedience to the system. Uh, and then this sort of commentary on like the modern day society, uh, images of violence and death don't affect us. You know, I grew up with seeing a lot of horror movies and death and then even those, those movies, uh, faces of death. And, you know, I, I've read that a lot of that was faked and stuff, but it looks pretty real. So it does definitely affect you It's desensitizing to violence and death. Uh, sex is as mundane as a handshake. Completely disconnected from reality, no emotion to make us care, and differences are called arms. And then this is another thing too. I mean, that happened ever since the '60s, but it got crazier and crazier. Where to where it's like um, connections between human beings means nothing, emotions suppressed more and more and more. There's actually a movie that came out that talked about that um, equilibrium with um, Christian Bale, and, and it was talking about a dystopian future, and they would take drugs, they inject them in their neck, I think. And it would suppress all their emotions. Uh, and then last paragraph I said, electronic parents propagating fear and distractions, hypnotizing to demoralize, desensitize, and instill the need for consumption. Okay, again, so going along with that theme of brainwashing, you know, we talked about it's going through the public education system, different things in society, media, and then... You know, the TV, too. It's a huge thing how important TV is. You know, and now it's obviously more smartphones and the internet, computers. But growing up, it, TV was huge for such a long time. Um, everybody just sitting in front of that. Children left in front of television for hours and hours and hours as a babysitter. And it's brainwashing. And, and it's instilling, it's absolutely instilling uh, opinions and values uh, hypnotizing, you know, I could even say that after 10 minutes, they say you go into an alpha state. So you stop critically analyzing information that comes into your brain. So then you just accept it. It just goes right in there. Uh, demoralizing, desensitizing. Yeah, a need for consumption. I mean, talk about the advertising, right? Always need the commercial breaks. And it, and over and over again, you get annoyed because they play the same commercials over and over and over again. Well, what is that? Repetition. And just putting in putting that in you, the need to consume. Every time you go out, consume. Um, why? Well, we're, you know, the United States, the biggest nation of consumers has been for a long time. And we outsourced our production to China and, and they produced, we consume. All we do is consume. And so they put that in you. And it's like people can go, they can't even go into stores 
and buy one thing, they always you feel the need to like buy more. Uh, so that's instilled in everyone. So a lot of stuff there about that brainwashing in society. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep it moving. All right. <laughs> it's like coffee stains on it or something. Never a moment of solitude. No chance for reflection. Never questioning what you're told. Never wondering where you're going. Yeah, and that's a huge thing too. Is like how it happens in society, in society where I always want to keep people's minds occupied on things. Uh, like I said, the entertainment. You're either, you know, you, from the moment you wake up, you go to school early, you're there all day, come home, you're in front of the television, and all these things, it's always distractions of brainwashing, these types of things. There's no chance for reflection, as I said. Not, n never time to uh, sit down and think about things. And uh, same thing with, happens to people even when they're adults. You know, there's no time when you, you have, uh, you work all day, people come home, they're busy, they got family and, ta and errands and all, and then and TV too and distractions. And there's no, very little time where they sit and think to, and, and that's on purpose. Because if you, if you sit and think enough, especially if you read, you, uh, then you might start to question what you're told. And where society's going and start to think these types of things. They don't want you to think. Just shut up and be a, a drone that obeys, right? And, and worker bee. Uh, sedated, pampered, convenience. Yeah, that's this modern day society. Oh man, is it ever. Sedated with drugs and, and but booze is a drug too, right? Uh, all, all the, and all the other legal prescription ones. Pampered with conveniences. I mean, it's insane. For thousands of years... Nobody had the conveniences that we have in modern day first world society with the air conditioning and the heating and the, and all and all the other appliances that we have and the running water and the hot showers anytime we want and and everything everything we need very convenient and it's made us soft soft little uh little obedient slaves easy to control um, okay, let's continue. Temporary, temporary satisfaction from instant gratification. A constant need for entertainment. Obsessive compulsive communication. You know, I think this is about the time that uh, phones were starting to get more popular back in the day. A lot of people, I saw a lot of people texting and stuff and, and, and social media was starting to come around. Uh, MySpace <laughs> and then the uh, early days of Facebook and stuff. But I still noticed it. And uh, But yeah, the, the temporary... The uh, constant need for entertainment, I already talked about that. But obsessive compulsive communication, it's like people people will grab their phones and look at them or start typing, texting without even thinking about it. It's like a trained uh, instinct. It's just from doing it over and over and over again. And instant gratification, you know, uh, that's how they train society. And, and nowadays it's even, it's even crazier because people get temporary satisfaction from the instant gratification of you post on social media someone gives likes whatever retweets all these other types of things that gives it uh, they they've actually studied this they studied the psychology of this to get people that they show that uh, people have dopamine that's released and they get them in these dopamine feedback loops so where you get addicted your brain actually gets addicted to um, the these things like the interaction with social media and the likes and all those other types of things. So yeah, it is um, obsessive, becomes obsessive compulsive. Um, okay. Technology has created stress and complexity. Infiltrated our lives through a veil of simplicity and convenience, right? And it's, isn't that always how it happens like with te technology when they sell it to people and they advertise it? It's like, um, you know, oh, it's going to make your life so much more simple and convenient. But then, you know, people. a lot of times people complain about stuff, the technology and their phones and stuff like, oh, because they always have it with them. They can't escape it. And there's just more and more things that, that it adds to your life uh, as opposed to the simplicity of, you know, maybe people used to get off work and then just go take a hike in the woods and sit down and, and just chill for a while. And it's all, it's just constantly connected to this stuff. Can't even get away from it. Uh, all right, let's continue. Taught to worship the vain achievements of man. Absolutely. Awaken. So this is more like a lyrical style. This is why it's uh, written this way. <laughs> Some of it's kind of funny, right? Uh, awaken the roaming. Awaken the roaming corpses. 
Uh, people that are just like they're just like zombies, right? End this slumber of ignorance, callous and jaded souls, overloaded with useless knowledge, completely devoid of wisdom. Your eyes are open, but you can't see. Right, and that's another point. Before I move on, that's a good point to talk about at the end. Overloaded with useless knowledge. Um, you know, it's like our society um, loves that type of stuff. You know, people go on who wants to be a millionaire and all that stuff. Uh, and they know all kinds of facts about sports teams and all the players and all the facts about, you know, celebrities and actors and, and musicians and, and all these other types of things. And their mind is filled with knowledge, so they think they know a lot, but you just actually know about a bunch of garbage. That doesn't even matter, you know? Useless knowledge. People's minds are just filled with it. And what's crazy is, like, people think it even puffs people up and they get, like, proud of it. And they think they know a lot because they, they know a bunch of garbage. Um, you know, and then there's that other thing they call, what do they call that? The Dunning-Kruger effect, where people that uh, actually don't know that much are more arrogant and they think they know more because they're not aware, self-aware of how much they don't know. So they're they're more um, proudful about what uh, prideful about what they know. It's just uh, that's. But there you go. That's another description of our society. Here's another one. Moving on. This one's a little short one. The unsuspect. And by the way, it's going to get crazier and crazier. So please um, pay attention. It's going to get well very specific too. The unsuspecting populace lay asleep. Unaware of what quietly approaches, a complete transformation of the human being, the integration and synergy of four technologies, nanobio and infocognitive. Okay, that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves, so we'll move on there. We'll talk about that at the end. <laughs> All right, let's continue to the next one. D, this, I guess, was a song, DNA. I, it's not going to be called Derogatory Neurological Assessment. <laughs> Apparently, I rejected that title. All right, let's continue. Oh, this is about science. Okay. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic. I think I'll just read all the way through and then I'll explain it. Um, I think I was thinking about like people like Tesla and uh, uh, things like that. All right. Arrogance of the human race can be found within science. The religion of the skeptics. Experts, quote unquote, experts have the final say. You ever hear what does it sound like today? Right? Trust the experts. Trust the science. Experts have the final say. Determine what is possible or not. Labeling everything misunderstood with the stamp of disapproval. Uh, terrified of the unknown. What lies on the other side cannot handle what might be shown. Destroying mankind's pride. A few push against the grain. Willing to live a life of pain. Battling for years an endless fight to bring suppressed truths to the light. Uh, eventually, these scientists will come to find only the elite decide what is revealed to mankind. Play the game or credibility is lost. Yeah, there's a lot there. Very interesting thing. Yeah, when it comes to science and even the field of medicine, doctors, stuff like that, uh, it's totally controlled, absolutely, uh, by corporations and these types of things. And then sort of playing off what it says at the end, play the game or credibility is lost. You know, this control, you, you know, you can be the greatest, smartest scientist or doctor or whatever in the world but no one's going to listen to you unless you have you know the authority that comes with getting published in journals and, and these types of things you have peer review peer review is huge in, in these worlds uh you know if you don't if you're if, they, if your papers your studies aren't peer reviewed they're like oh okay well whatever we just it's not very credible the problem is a lot of these publications that do those types of things, they're controlled and there's corruption and there's conflicts of interest and, and it goes up the corporate ladder and, and there's, you know, dirty money involved and backdoor deals. And so it's not really, you know, whoever is the smartest and comes up with their own idea, it goes to the top and we get to find out about it. So that's not true at all. Uh, and then also, you know, suppress truths and stuff like that. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that we don't have today that we could. Um... There's people that have made, allegedly, things like uh, engines run, that run on water or magnets, um, things that can move, you know, technology that can move giant stones with sound and whatever, free energy technology. Look at all that type of stuff, right? And you look at, even look at like Tesla himself. Go back. He, you know, he discovered a bunch of stuff and then a lot of it got stolen. Um, Thomas Edison taking credit for stuff, you know, and whatever. All types of stuff like that. And there's other people, too. And so now, though, they're terrified of, uh, I'm sorry, not terrified, they're, um, 
you know, the scientists and the doctors are scared to go against the grain because they'll get stamped out. They'll either get, you know, they're, they're, they won't have any credibility. They'll get, look at what happened today. Anyone that went against the narrative the past couple years, right, with the pandemic, what happened? Banned off social media. People would, you know, would um, bring up petitions to get them have their, their license, their medical licenses taken away. And it's all controlled by these boards, you know, and, and it's, this is all the type, the type of stuff that I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of that stuff right there. Let's move on to the next one. All right. Legion of Parasites. Yeah, this was a song actually that, uh, from back in the day. All right. So moving on to politicians. Read some of this. Corrupt politicians plague the world. They must be exposed and purged. I don't mean purged in, in a way that would get me banned from YouTube. The good way, right? Claiming to represent the public's opinion, intent on expansion of their dominion with the suit of flesh to hide the hideous appearance of deception. Yes, so obviously we have corrupt politicians, right? Um, they claim, but here's a big thing. They claim to represent the public's opinion. They all do, right? Whether Republican, Democrat, anyone else, they claim, oh yeah, I represent you, your values, your opinions, and they'll get on a stage and lie and say, oh yeah, this is what, if I get in, this is what I'm going to do. And I support blah, 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 and all this stuff. And then they get in and they don't do it. Why? Because they're intent on expansion of their dominion, their power, their control, their uh, money. Let's continue. All power and strength shall flee from their hands. No more shall this legion of parasites rule the land. You know, this is me uh, imagining what what I would like to happen. <laughs> and and these are called parasites, right? Because they say uh, politician. Uh, if you break down the world, the word poly means many. Tick is a blood sucking insect, right? A parasite. So, anyways, they uh, thrive on the hatred we have for ourselves sucking the life from our veins, eating away at the fabric of humanity, never satisfied by their gains, slaves to the corporation's interest. They have no desire to benefit mankind, forced to follow orders or face replacement, nothing but puppets. They have no allegiance to you. And absolutely, that's what I believed 17 years ago. That's what I believe today still. They don't. They have no allegiance to you. They do not represent you. They don't want to benefit you. No desire to benefit mankind. They don't care. They get paid off by thousands and thousands of dollars from corporations' interests. They go do insider deals, insider trading. Doesn't matter which side of the aisle it is. The aisle it is. They, uh, same thing. They're puppets. So, um, absolutely, I agree with that 100%. And then I said, starve the snakes wearing crowns. Now, you know, you could starve these snakes wearing crowns if you if people stopped uh, giving money to these giant corporations that uh, fund them. But that would take, you know, mass amount of people to all degree to, to, to all agree to stop doing that. But uh, I don't know if they will. Plus, they're addicted to their products and kind of kind of like they did it on purpose. Right. Because then you can't stop buying it. <laughs> all right. Let's continue to the next one. Uh, the war on terror. Yeah, this is a big subject, right? Especially after 9-11. It, it was a huge thing for a while, especially in the truth movement. There was a lot of hope that if people did enough exposing of that, that there'd be some you know new investigation and all these types of things and the truth would come out. But um, here we are 20 years plus later and it uh, hasn't happened. But anyways, the war on terror is the war for your soul false enemies they fabricate to frighten you into submission the true enemy is behind the curtain pulling the strings of the politicians we are supposed to trust right so that was again that was a big thing in the truth community back then is that seeing like you know they say the war on terror after these attacks was supposed to you know get rid of terrorism especially in other countries so they don't attack us again but then they're, you know, like, oh, in order to do this war on terror, we have to, you know, pass the Patriot Act and take away your rights. And it's all for your safety. It's all for your good. And, and guess what? We still have the TSA today and all those other types of things. But then also there was this warning all the way back then 
that guess what? These, if we gave these types of powers through the Patriot Act and the, and the National Defense Authorization Act to the the state, that to to say that oh we're giving you these powers to use it only against our enemies, only against terrorists in other countries, we said that's all you're going to use it for. But there was people warning back then, and I was one of them, that said hey, that power you give them is going to be used against the citizens of this country one day turned against you and here we are and now they're calling people the citizens half the citizens of this country domestic terrorists oh man i'm so shocked i'm not if you're shocked it's because you have been asleep and haven't been paying attention for a long time because it's been a long time coming let's continue We're gonna, it's gonna get starting to get more intense now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna start to overdose on red pills now. Uh, we got some names at the top: Rothschild, Rockefeller, Morgan, Habsburg. These are uh, very wealthy families. You may be aware of, may not. And this is what I wrote about back then. Those who control money control the world. Now I'll tell you the the uh, what's behind that particular line. There uh, was a member, the the founder, I believe, one of the founders of the Rothschild family. I forget. I'm a little rusty on that history. But Meyer Amschel Bauer, who changed his name to Rothschild, which means which means uh, Red Shield. He said, "Give me control over a nation's currency, and I care not who makes his laws." And it was sort of about going off that. So those who control the money control the world. Wars are engineered. A small few fund both sides of a war. In the aftermath, they make loans again so nations can rebuild. Countries severely in debt. Exchange land and property to these private banks to clear their debt. This is how a small group of people can control the world. Um... So basically behind that, if you go research that, uh, sort of what the Rothschild family did, fund both sides of a war. And again, like I said, they make, they make, they make loans to countries. They were like, oh, well, we can't pay you back. All right, well, we'll take property. We'll take land. They own land. They gain a lot of control, a lot of wealth from, the, from uh, profiting off of war and being owners of banks. Okay, the bankers. Uh, you could even say Illuminati bankers. That's what we're talking about here, right? And private banks, that's an important thing, you know, when you learn, especially right at the beginning, that the Federal Reserve is a private bank, that the word federal in there isn't really, it makes you think it's part of the federal government, right? But it's no more federal than, uh, uh, like, uh, from the federal government than Federal Express, okay? It's a private bank. And uh, these families have interest in that bank, and it's, and you know, it's created all the way back in 1913, and it's one of the worst things that we allowed to happen in this country to create a lot of control, and it does it does play in with war and booms and busts and these types of things, cause a lot of damage. But anyways, it's central banking anywhere, so you know, it's the Federal Reserve in our country, but in other countries too, big central banks cause a lot of uh, problems. And I put. Uh, endogamy on the side you know about keeping business within the family and these types of things these families continue from generation to generation utilizing their wealth to gain more power yeah and they actually had specific very strict rules for their families like the Rothschild family where you know you could only um, do certain business activities with you had to keep it within the family and you know a lot of these families they actually write out they document their histories they actually have, they'll have like histories of their families inside their houses in personal libraries. And fam if you're a part of the family, you have to read it and you have to learn the history. And then they have like, they'll have like rules for the family. Like you'd have um, rules for a business. Like these are the things that you have to do. And then there's some, you know, there's a lot of things that the public doesn't even know that they, they talk about. But anyways... You know, it's very important for these families. They always keep it within the, the bloodlines and they, you know, they intermarry with each other. 
it's just been going on for a long time, these powerful families. So that's that's a huge thing with the bankers. So let's continue. This, all right, we're going to get... <laughs> we're stepping up a notch, just some crazy stuff. This was a song called Slaughter of the Profane or Slumber of Ignorance. I actually ended up calling it Slaughter of the Profane. Now, that word uh, profane is actually a word used by a lot of secret societies. Um... And they would refer to everyone outside of the secret society, the initiated. They would call them profane. Everyone outside who's uninitiated, the profane masses, right? They look down upon them. But let's see what we wrote here. Rise, awaken. We've been asleep for far too long. Well, they've been slowly building brick by brick, stone by stone. That's kind of using the terminology of Freemasons, right? In gradual increments, completely unnoticed, going about our lives, ignoring the truth. Now, that's an important concept. You might not think it is, but it is. Gradual incrementalism. Uh, you know, that, that the uh, analogy that everybody uses about the frog boiling in the pot of water, if you just turn it up all the way and it's boiling, he's going to jump right out. But if you gradually, over time, slowly turn up the heat, by the time it's all the way up, the frog's cooked and he doesn't jump out, he doesn't notice, and that's what they'd be doing to us. They can't do it all at once, you know? So that's like going back decades and decades, you wouldn't be able to say, okay, we're going to, you know, you're going to give up all these rights and, you know, every time you go to the airport, you're going to be frisked and have to go through an x-ray scanner and all this crap. People would be like, yeah, right, what are you talking about? I'm not going to do that. Um, but you do things over time. Gradually have things happen, you know, have things, uh, bad things happen, then they'll give it up. So, uh, gradual incremental is very important. Let's continue. And now we stand in the shadow of the new world order. And now we stand in the shadow of the pyramid we helped to create. Now, that's interesting because, you know, new world order, everybody's heard that phrase probably a million times. But if you go back and look at it, um, there's many famous politicians, leaders, presidents, all over the world, all using the same phrase over and over and over again. And it's on the back of the dollar bill, basically, you know, Novus Ordo Seclorum. It's the same thing, with an all-seeing eye and a pyramid and all that stuff, which, by the way, wasn't put on the dollar bill until 1933 when FDR was president. He was a Freemason. Also, Henry Wallace. He was the one responsible for putting it on there, high-level Freemason. They are talking about a new world order. They all talk about the same thing. Now, what are they talking about? Well, if you read their writings... You look at Kissinger and he's a big new Brzezinski and all these other people. And um, all of them. Look at their writings. They always talk about a one world system. And that's what I wrote about right here. One world government, one world military, one world bank with one electronic currency, one new religion. This is what they always talk about. They always talk about this, this new world order. It's a one world system. And, uh, you know, this they've been talking about this and trying to move towards this for a long time. But, you know, this is uh, stuff I was writing about back then. Microchips implanted underneath the, our skin, filled with every detail of our existence. We believe the lies thinly veiled as facts. Global control falls into their grasp. Yep. They, uh, yeah, they, isn't that funny? Uh, we think about fact checkers today and they are just um, lying to us but they say it's it's facts right um so uh you know these microchips too back in the day everybody was talking about the rfid chips are like the size of a grain of rice and stuff but there's even way crazier stuff than that and uh, we'll talk about that at the end of this uh, message um okay and then the end terror and propaganda brainwashing minds now we trade liberty for security desecrating the graves of those who died for freedom, refusing to question what's before our eyes, we lead ourselves to slaughter. And there's a lot in there. Um, you know, and, and the uh, terror and propaganda, brainwashing minds, you know, this would be what they call, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to dance on the edge of what I can say on here. <laughs> um, it'd be like if you had a flag, right? But the flag wasn't real. Like a fake flag. <laughs> You had some fake flags, and then you attacked something. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Terror and propaganda, those types of things. Um, and it really, you know, they have figured they have it figured out that 
you know, if you make people fear, they're easier to control. So it's all about fear, fear, fear over and over again. You can control people, and then what will they do? Trade liberty for security, right? You scare people, get them really afraid, they will give up their liberty for security. You know, and everybody knows that infamous quote from Benjamin Franklin, those who trade liberty for security deserve neither, right? You, keep, you say, oh, I want to be safe. Well, another quote, I uh, forget, another founding father said, I prefer dangerous freedom to peaceful slavery. And that's the give and take that you have. You know, the more safety that you want, the less freedom you're going to have. You want more freedom? Well, it's going to be a little bit dangerous. And you're responsible for your own uh, security and, and your own life. But we traded it away, and we kept trading it away, especially the Patriot Act. We just really gave up a lot, and then it's just been more and more and more and more. Um, and we don't question what's before us, right? And, and one other thing before I move on, I said up here, we stand in the shadow of the New World Order, and now we stand in the shadow of the pyramid we helped to create. Because everybody that talks about this stuff, they're like, well, you know, they're... There's a conspiracy and they're creating this and they're in control and they control everything and they're forcing us on everyone. But, you know, it's not entirely true because, yes, they are doing that, but, you know, a lot of humanity helped to it's this to happen. Like I said, they willingly, you know, consented to give up their freedom and they say, oh, well, you know, this is going to help us fight the terrorists, give up some of our freedom, these types of things. People were convinced of that. They went along with it. They didn't question it. And uh, that's why it was allowed to happen. If people would have just said no, then it wouldn't have happened. So, yeah, you did help to build this pyramid. That's a fact. All right, so that's that's a pretty graphic description of one world government, uh, new world order, these types of things. Let's continue. We're almost at the top of these, actually. Uh, now, okay, now we're going to get into some more like... Um, esoteric stuff because there's all that New World Order political stuff, but then you know, you see especially like uh, what these people believe, the highest levels, they all belong to secret societies, like everyone you look at so many famous people they belong to secret societies Freemasons is one of the biggest ones, right? but there's a bunch of other societies too that they belong to, just go look it up, it's a fact you don't even have to research that long and don't you think it's weird? Why didn't, you know, why did people think it was weird when, you know, George W. Bush was running and John Kerry and they're both members of Skull and Bone Society and they asked him that even on the news and he said, what does that mean? And they're like, I don't know. It's a secret. And they laughed about it and then no one ever said anything. Like, you know, obviously conspiracy people said stuff about it, but like the vast majority of society didn't care. It's like, dude, yeah, I care if the president belongs to a society called Skull and Bones and they do really creepy, weird stuff, rituals. And uh, what are they doing, by the way? What kind of deals do they make with each other in college that they say, hey, this is what we're going to do when we leave here and we're all like, you know, politicians and, and CEOs of corporations. We're going to help each other out. No one ever looks into that. But anyways... So there's some, a lot of spiritual stuff they get into. So we're going to talk about that. And the highest levels, they, they're into some pretty crazy esoteric occult stuff. They all are. It's, it's just a fact. So um, here's some, uh, some stuff about that. Pierce the exoteric veil, right? So if there's a... They have symbols, right? In secret societies, there's the esoteric and exoteric. Esoteric is only what the few, the initiated on the inside, understand. That's like the, mean, the inner meaning of a symbol. And exoteric is what they tell the masses, what they think about it. Pierce the exoteric veil, see through the smoke and mirrors, and sleight of hand, I spelled that wrong, of a fraternal order with origins of ancient mystery. Nimrod, the first priest of Baal. Oh yeah, because even in, dude, even in uh, this book, Benjamin Franklin, who's a Freemason, by the way, and part of the Hellfire Club, Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason, wrote a book, a history of Freemasons in his book, which I have looked at, he said Nimrod was the first Freemason. Benjamin Franklin said that, okay, out of his own mouth. Nimrod, the first priest of Baal, the king of Shinar, architect of the Tower of Babel, the first attempt at a one world government to pass down the plan and overcome the barrier of diverse tongues, a system of symbolism was devised 
for the initiated few to continue the great work through the ages, sworn to secrecy under penalty of death, right? They, take, they always take oaths in these secret societies, like every degree of initiation, right? In the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, there's 33 degrees, and every oath they go up, uh, every degree they go up, it's a different oath they have to take. And they say, I, you know, I swear to not tell the secrets of this degree or else I'll have my left breast torn open and my heart tossed out and crows will eat it and all this crazy stuff, right? Well, uh, so they're sworn to secrecy under penalty of death. But then the symbolism thing I wanted to talk about, uh, Manly Palmer Hall talks about that. He's very, very high authority within Freemasonry. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He wrote this book, a cult book called Secret Teachings of All Ages, a bunch of other books. But he said that he was talking about symbolism and that that was the, the the biggest method of communication used by secret societies and these people for thousands of years that uh, they use symbols to communicate with each other. And he goes, obviously, it can go across language barriers across the world. And if they if you understand that language, you understand the meaning of symbols, then they, okay, they can all just communicate with each other without speaking, just using symbols. So that's important with uh, secret societies. And you might, maybe you should learn a little bit more about that. Wonder why there is a pyramid on the back of the dollar bill when there ain't no pyramids in America. It doesn't even make any sense. And there's some floating eye in a triangle above that. Why is that there? It doesn't make any sense. Nobody even questions it. Okay, let's continue. Symbols. All right, this is the, uh, almost the last one. This is, this is what we're going to get. We're going to get way crazier. <laughs> I'm actually going to bring up an article about this because it's so crazy. All right, so it's talking about Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. The original sin to think one can be a god. Now, once again, convergence approaches. Separate faiths and denominations of the New Age unified for a common purpose. The glorification of man. New Tower of Babel. Freemasonry, the ancient mysteries of Egypt. The old religion reinstated for the new world order, passed down through the ages, the appearance of the, I was going to say Masonic, but I went with cosmic Christ, probably because one of the fathers of the new age was a man named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit. And he wrote a book about the cosmic Christ. The appearance of the cosmic Christ to reveal the mysteries to revive the churches in a new form. Yeah, it's talking about all this like the New Age movement and stuff and secret societies. The veil of Isis will be lifted. So they talk about that in the occult. And um, what's her name? Helena H.P. Blavatsky wrote a book about that. Isis, what was it called? She had the secret doctrine and then Isis unveiled. Yeah, that was another one. All right, then I talk about... Uh, so that's all about, um, you know... It's kind of like uh, in the Bible it talks about the serpent tempting Adam and Eve and says that if they eat of the tree of knowledge, they could be, they'll be as gods, right? And it's just the same thing in the New Age movement. They're saying everybody can become a god. And it's, it's in the New Age movement, it's in secret societies. It's everybody just become a god, right? Everybody's gods. Freemasonry, you can become a god. You go up to initiation. The higher, you go to the highest level of initiation, you're a god, you're ascended master, all that stuff, right? And then actually what we was talking about here is that these these uh, changing the churches and reviving the ancient mysteries, basically what it's about is that, you know, it, it's, there's another book too, another person who was uh, Alice Bailey. And they, they originally had this company called Lucifer Publishing Company. And it was, they changed the name to Lucius Trust. But Alice Bailey talked about this. She wrote a book called Externalization of the Hierarchy. And there's, so, there's like this process that they want to do of indoctrinating the masses, actually. Because it's only been for the elite few, the inner, the initiated in secret societies. They were only allowed to know the mysteries. But there, she was talking about this process of gradually bringing all those inner esoteric secrets out into the open. And it kind of goes along with what another guy said, high-level Freemason Albert Pike. He helped to create the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, actually. Uh, only Confederate general to have a statue in D.C., which I think was torn down. But uh, Anyways, Albert Pike wrote a book that a lot of Masons read. It's called Morals and Dogma. 
And he said uh, he was supposed to have a, a letter that was written to another guy named Giuseppe Mazzini, who is purported to be the actual true founder of the mafia. Uh, and because they, they said mafia stood for, in Italian, it stood for something like uh, Mazzini authorizes arson and theft and something like that. Go look it up. You'll find that. But anyways, uh, Pike wrote a letter to Mazzini, supposedly in the 1800s, which outlined three world wa wars. And the first two descriptions of World War One and World War Two are pretty accurate. And then the third world war, he talks about kind of like between the Zionists and the Muslim world and their you know, Zionist allies and stuff, creating World War Three, and then all these other things. But then he says, after all this chaos, finally we can bring the Luciferian doctrine out of the open view. It's kind of like what this is talking about, about how it'll finally be brought out, all these things. And another thing that ties together with this too is co sort of like if you look at all different religions, they have a kind of an exoteric big religion for the masses then an esoteric mystical part. For instance, in Islam, they have the general religion, Islam for the masses, but then the mystical esoteric order would be Sufism, right? The practice, I should say, the mystical Islam is Sufism uh, within the Catholic, you know, this Catholic Church of the masses. Within that, there's, you know, inner orders, the Jesuits, which I'm going to talk about after this, Opus Dei, Knights of Malta, whatever, these types of things. Uh, Judaism, they have that for the masses and then inner core, Kabbalah, these types of things, right? So exoteric for the masses, inner mystical core. Well, they want to bring all this mystical core to the forefront. And then actually that ties together with some other stuff if you look into it. Uh, there's another thing called traditionalism nowadays. It's, not, it's been around for a while. Um, a lot of it was created by this guy named Rene Gunan. And then uh, Julius Avola was into it. And now uh, some guys in modern day times are actually into it. Like Alexander Dugan. And um, basically they believe the same thing. That there is this esoteric core to all the religions, this truth... And that there, in the past, there was actually just one religion that had this truth, and they all got split apart. And they wanted, to, they want to get back to that one true religion. So this, it all kind of ties together. Very interesting stuff. But anyways, the end of this um, this page we talked about starts talking about transhumanism, right? And th again, this is years ago, many years ago, fifteen years ago. So transhumanism. I start talking about this. NBIC. Nanobioinfocognitive technology. Fusing mankind's consciousness together to form a hive mind connected to a supercomputer by artificial intelligence. Um, sorry. Connected to a supercomputer controlled by artificial intelligence. Human thought linked by satellite. Now, that sounds pretty crazy, right? But I am going to show you some... Uh, Crazy information now on the screen. I'm going to show you some articles. I'm going to show you a publication that came out all the way back in 2002. And it will blow your mind. Blow your mind. It's totally insane. So uh, this ties together, though. You, you might think, well, what does that have to do with what we just talked about? Well, it does. You see, one aspect is the esoteric, mystical stuff like that, becoming a god. But they need the technology aspect in order to achieve this. See, man can't become a god without the aid of this technology. That's what they want to do. So, let's go on over to look at some of this information. All right? So, um, I'm just going to show you a couple things real quick. So, there's this concept of technological convergence. Technological convergence, also known as digital convergence, is the tendency for technologies that were originally unrelated to become more closely integrated and even unified as they develop and advance. For example, watches, telephones, televisions, computers, and social media platforms began as separate and mostly unrelated technologies, but have converged in many ways into interrelated parts of a telecommunication and media industry, sharing common elements of digital electronics and software okay yeah so they start they're all separate then they slowly start being merged and merge and merge until they all become one right and we see that a lot of those are merged together in phones but it you know they're talking about this going even farther than that uh integrated into human beings so 
But let's look at this, converging technological fields. We need to learn what this NBIC stuff is. NBIC, an acronym for nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science was in 2014 the most popular term for converging technologies. It was introduced into public discourse through the publication of Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance. Now, we're going to look at that paper because that is what is insane. A report sponsored in part by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Again, what I tell you about those, you know, those foundations, the controlling, uh, those that control the information. Various other acronyms have been offered for the same concepts such as GNR, doesn't stand for Guns and Roses, it stands for Genetics, Nanotechnology, and Robotics. Uh, journalists, blah, blah, all right. So they kind of just talk about that. And then another acronym they have is BANG, <laughs> Bits, Atoms, Neurons, and Genes. And I think you guys need to go back to the NBIC. All right, so let's look at this. Converging Technology for Improving Human Performance. What was that? I got this graphic over here. This is the cover of the 2002 report. And as you can see, it says nano, bio, info, cogno, cognitive, right? And they're all merged together in a point above a human and a brain. What is this talking about? Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance is a 2002 report. Came out 20 years ago. Commissioned by the U.S. National Science Foundation and Department of Commerce, the report contains descriptions and commentaries on the state of the science and technology of the combined fields of nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science by major contributors to these fields. Potential uses of these technologies in improving health, overcoming disability, are discussed in the report, as well as ongoing work on planned applications of human enhancement technologies in the military uh, and in rationalization of human-machine interface in industrial settings. Okay, so... Now we're going to look at this article because you see what they do? They always do this with this technology and the agendas. Well, it can help you overcome disability and improve your health. I always try to sell you as, sell it to you as something good, right? It's going to help you. Kind of like Elon Musk talking about, oh yeah, the Neuralink brain implant, it's going to help improve people that have problems. People that are disabled, yeah. I'm sure that's the main purpose of it. But anyways, let's look at this because this is going to, it might blow your mind if you've never heard about this stuff. This is the end game, guys. End game type of stuff. What utopia can technology deliver? This is, came out in 2002, 20 years ago. Look at what they were saying. Catch a glimpse of the future. A new government-sponsored report calls for harnessing the converging strands of science and technology to transform society and bring about a golden age in 20 years, really. Yeah, well, they're a little behind on the schedule, but it's okay. Uh, it, the science. Just just think about that meme today. Trust the science. <laughs> That's what the, they love to have you do that. Okay. Technology has made enormous leaps in the last 20 years. Looking back, I can see a progression of improvements that we could not easily have predicted. However, I can identify a consistent theme throughout that period that I call faster, better, cheaper, smarter, smaller. The fact is we have leveraged the effect of Moore's law to produce increasingly powerful products. But while we have become... Now listen to this stuff that is talked about in this article. It's just insane. But while we have become more mobile, we are still mostly tied to a keyboard. And while software is smarter, the promise of artificial intelligence and agents that intuit and respond to your needs remains unfulfilled. Well, 20 years later, an artificial intelligence is actually getting pretty insane. I don't know if you guys have kept on the up and up with that. But uh, you can look into uh, D-Wave and, and some other guys. Even, um, you know, there, there's some other stuff they were talking about recently that it's pretty wild what they can do with artificial intelligence. But anyways, in this context, I was intrigued to read a 405-page report. So you could probably read that. Uh, from the National... Oh, no way. Uh, the address Loyola.edu. Of course, connected to the Jesuits. Oh, my goodness. All right. I, was, I didn't even see that before. I was intrigued to read a 405-page report from the National Science Foundation. 
and the Department of Commerce that looks 20 years into the future. The report, with the hefty title, Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance, Nanotechnology, Biotechnology, Information Technology, and Cognitive Science, includes contributions from more than 50 scientific leaders and policymakers. Okay, this isn't some random fringe thing. 50 top scientific leaders and policymakers contributed to this. I was a little thrown by... I was a little thrown by part of the title, Improving Human Performance, thinking it might be about creating a super race. Well, maybe it is. But the report has more noble ambitions. Sure. In addition to compiling various futuristic scenarios, the report calls for harnessing the converging strands of science and technology to transform society and bring about a golden age. Oh, doesn't that sound great? A golden age through technology. Quote, understanding of the mind and brain will enable the creation of a new species of intelligent machine systems that can generate economic wealth on a scale hitherto unimaginable. See how they're trying to sell this to you that's going to make a lot of money and you won't have to work, right? Within a half century, intelligent machines might create the wealth needed to provide food, clothing, shelter, education, medical care, a clean environment, and physical and financial security for the entire world population. Oh, isn't it sound wonderful? It's like heaven on earth. No one has to work and everyone has everything they walk, want because it's made by these benevolent intelligent machines. Intelligent machines may eventually generate the production capacity to support universal prosperity and financial security for all human beings. Thus, the engineering of the mind is much more than the pursuit of scientific curiosity. It is more even than a monumental technological challenge. It is an opportunity to eradicate poverty and usher in the golden age for all humankind. Sounds like a great speech of a dictator, right? And always, some of the most evil stuff has been done to us under the guise of eradicating poverty. <laughs> uh, and it's still here. But let's continue. The path of this utopian... And by the way, it gets crazier. path of this utopian vision of the future is the synergistic combination of nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science under the acronym NBIC. Among the possible technological achievements... Check this out. Envisioned. Our brain-to-brain -brain interaction, direct brain control of devices via neuromorphic engineering, retarding the aging process, elimination of communication barriers due to disability or language, and invulnerable data networks. Kind of sounds like what I was writing about earlier. Brain-to-brain -brain interaction, communicating without talking. Controlling devices with your brain. Retarding the age process. They, wanna, they want to create immortality. Reverse aging. And eliminate communication barriers like language barriers. And you know what that is? Like I said in, in the lyrics, re reversing the Tower of Babel. So there will no longer be a language barrier and technology eliminates it. Now you might say, oh, that's really cool. But do they have good intentions? They always say that they do, right? But this will make that possible. You know, access, instant access to information through your brain. At the more extreme and controversial, controversial end of the spectrum, the report predicts routine brain implants. <laughs> well, predicting brain implants. Oh, of course, you got to have that. Kind of like I said, Neuralink. Oh, isn't that interesting? He wants to do brain implants. He wants to... He launched satellites. And he's also doing... Art, working with artificial intelligence. Kind of like all these things connected together. When you think Elon Musk is a good guy. Take a look at his mother. Wow. Wow. You know, if you know anything about anything, you'll see she's into some, she's a strange lady. Anyways, political rights for robots. 
That sounds great. Will they earn the right to vote in presidential elections? Uh, political rights for robots, the capability. Because, you know, that's interesting because they, they were, uh, Ray Kurzweil, he was, you know, trying to argue that robots, artificial intelligence, can have consciousness. Uh, and the capability for people to extend their personalities into cyberspace by uploading them to the solar system wide web. The same thing. Kurzweil, uh, Ray Kurzweil said the same thing. Upload your, your personality onto the internet, right? Uh, the report also discusses the development of predictive science that could anticipate social changes and apply corrective actions. Perhaps similar to the precogs in Minority Report. Oh, doesn't that sound great? It also envisions the capability to ingest megabytes of knowledge without about any topic in moments by enhancing sensory perception, like The Matrix. Like all these movies that they've been programming people with for decades. Uh, isn't it crazy though? Anticipate social changes and apply corrective actions. Well, what would those corrective actions be of predicting that someone's going to have a thought crime, Right? It's crazy. In a more pragmatic vein, convergence of nanotechnology, biotechnology, and cognitive science could result in cosmetics that change with the user's moods, enhancing emotional expressiveness. I'm not sure about the practical application of that feature, but clothing fabrics that adjust automatically to changing temperatures and weather would be nice to have. Wouldn't that be nice? Again, they sell it to you with the things that sound good. Don't tell you about the control aspect. Embedded sensors and nanoscale robots that monitor your health and make appropriate adjustments to keep you in optimal condition would be great, especially if they could dramatically improve our healthcare systems. Oh, yes! Embedded sensors and nanobots inside my body would be great. Thank you so much. I just can't wait. <laughs> Unbelievable. Solving all the world's problems through this convergence of science and technology requires a large stretch of the imagination. Not really. It's, they're developing it, as do many of the concepts in this report. And by the way, another thing is, there is secret technology that they have, you know, these secret bases, that's many years ahead of what we're allowed to see in the public. Dude, before you get a smartphone that's mass-produced to millions and millions of people, Billions of people. You think they didn't have that stuff on small scale many years before that? By the time that hits the market, it's already ready for mass production. They had that long before that. Come on. Think about it. Um, while I am fascinated by the science, the notion that humanity would become like a single transcendent nervous system, an interconnected brain based in new core pathways of society, as suggested by the report's primary authors, is hard to buy. No, it's not. Maybe for you, Mr. 20 years ago, man. Well, it's funny because I was learning about that back then and I was like, yeah, that's exactly where we're going. And we just keep going in that direction. A lot more advances since then. We are still a society partly bent on self-destruction. Well, this is true, for sure. Our appetite for violence and reality TV remains intact. Advances over the next 20 years won't change human nature unless everyone gets gene therapy and we end up with a society of smiley faces. No, that's not going to happen. In fact, the report devotes an extensive chapter to the future of war and combat, which envisions a battlefield occupied by uninhabited combat vehicles, drones, and soldiers with enhanced physical and mental capacities. So much for utopia. Yeah, exactly. They want cyborg soldiers and drones. That's what they want the battlefields to be. Exactly. And guess what? There's also the population reduction agenda. 100%. You know, they've said this. Even uh, Ted Turner, he talks about 95% reduction in present levels. It would be ideal. Reduce the population by a massive amount. And then it'd be easier to scale this technology, get everyone hooked into it, and do this utopian idea that they want. Okay? Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to read from this. So, you know, just talk about enhancing humans. And that's how they can become God, through this technology. But the nano, you know, the NBIC technology, it's pretty wild. And you look at that. Yeah, exactly. That's the end of that. Okay, so. Um... Yeah, but getting back to that. So, you know, this NBIC technology, it's 
it's pretty it's pretty wild it's it's uh I think that's exactly what they need. You know, of course, they could add some things in there, some modifications as technology advances. But this seems like, you know, what they could use to use technology to achieve the goals of the secret societies, which is to have man become God. That's what they really want to do. So they need, they combine these esoteric beliefs, the Luciferian doctrine, um, all those types of things, the mysticism, with the technology to achieve their goals in a one world government and reduce the population. Combine it all together, and there it is. Now, one last thing I wanted to read before I go to the I have one last section. I actually have one last big surprise for the end uh, PDF. It's not too long, uh, it won't take me long, but I'm pretty much done these reading these sheets. One last sheet I wanted to read was one I wrote about the Jesuits. Which I was talking about back then too. Back in, uh, I actually knew about the Jesuits pretty pretty early on. Um, I was studying with a group of people, and they had some information on them. But anyways, uh, Sons of Loyola, the cause of all major wars and revolutions, pulling the strings of the banking families, instilling fear in all politicians, assassination if their will not be done. If you guys don't know anything about the Jesuits, you haven't learned about them. There's many many books that have been written about them for. Uh, you know, throughout history, they've been around for 500 years. A lot of people, famous people, talk about founding fathers talked about them. John Adams wrote about them. Napoleon, uh, the inventor of Morse code. A lot of people wrote about the Jesuits. A lot of people are educated by the Jesuits now. Okay, they've been in, connected to a lot of major events. Look up the gunpowder plot. They tried to blow up Parliament and King James and all kinds of crazy stuff. So they definitely very, very influential. Been kicked out of 80 countries. So that's what I was writing about them. Army of the Vatican, enemy of the Protestants, sent to torture heretics, even poisoning kings. No mercy for the women, no mercy for the children. This is, this is what they talk about in their oath, the Jesuit oath. All methods of violence are allowed in secret or in public. Quote, extirpate their execrable race from the face of the earth is the warning to all who do not kneel before the feet of the Pope. That's actually a quote from their oath. The Jesuit general, the Black Pope, commands all from within the confines of Rome, grand lodges of masonry, bloodlines of the Illuminati. And uh, yeah, I pretty much believe that. I mean, there's some other things, you know, papal bloodlines and a lot of crazy stuff I'm not going to get into right now. And they are, and if you if you don't understand that, it's not just that they're Catholic. If you think that, then you don't know what you're talking about. They're actually into the occult. Very powerful black magicians, which actually Blavatsky talked about herself in her writings. But that's a story for another day. Point is, uh, a lot of other crazy red pills back then, you know, over 15 years ago. So, a lot of crazy stuff in these lyrics. A lot of crazy stuff. Now, I have one major last point to make after uh, all this information. You know, we can go on and on and on. There's tons of stuff we can talk about. You know, obviously, I was, I was researching for years and years over and over all this stuff. And it was just on and on and on and on. Documentaries and books. I read so many books and documentaries. And, dude, it was crazy. One time I gave my dad uh, Alex Jones' documentary, 9-11, The Road to Tyranny, for a birthday present. <laughs> I was like, I just wanted him to listen. Everybody. Everywhere I went, I was just talking about this stuff. I was I just overdosed on red pills. It was crazy. So, you know, and I knew this stuff a long time ago, but I got a big point for you, though. A very important point. In fact, the most important point. And this is from a little paper that I wrote called Red Pill But Lost. So please pay attention because this is the most important part of this video. One thing I began to notice after studying so many different things for years was that it was very easy to just jump from one thing to the next. You get addicted to studying these things. You get this feeling that if you just uncover the next secret, you'll finally get to the truth and be settled. Except that day never comes. Never came. You just get addicted and you want to, oh, I need to find the next thing, I need to find the next thing. It's like you're trying to put together a puzzle except you don't have the box to figure out what picture you're trying to put together. So you're just finding another piece, another piece, another piece, trying to figure it all out, trying to untangle a giant knot, and it never ends. And so you just keep going and going and going and jumping from one topic to the next. It never ends. 
You know, there were some people like that in the Bible, the Athenians. It said this about them, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something uh, new, some new thing. Hey, tell us some new thing. They went to this marketplace, right? Everybody would just talk. Hey, I want to hear something new. And you, it's kind of like that thing you get addicted to. I want to hear something new. I want to learn something new, discover something new, read something, watch something. Not only that, but if you have no objective standard for, of determining truth, you don't even know what truth is. You have nothing to test it. This results in a lot of people jumping from one worldview to the next. They turn to New Age. They think everything's a simulation, whatever, all kinds of, of stuff, right? And that's what happens. You know, you, you find out about all this stuff and everybody, people get messed up into all, they get sucked into all weird beliefs. And they're all over the place. And they're changing all the time. One month it's this thing, next month it's the other thing. Even happened to me at one time. You know, I, I didn't know really what I believed. I kind of believed in God for a while. Then I read another book. Uh, you know, David I came out with a book one time. It was called Infinite Love is the Only Truth. Everything else is illusion. You're basically saying everything's a simulation, kind of like Elon Musk pushes. And it made me question, oh, is God even real? Maybe it's all a simulation. I don't know. You know, you just toss from one thing to the next. Thinking that you're searching for the truth. Ephesians 4.14 says this, that we henceforth be no more children, toss to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Hey, and that's what happens. You're tossed to and fro. You're like a ship at sea with no rudder. You got your sail up, but you don't control any direction you go. The wind's just tossing you to and fro. Here, over here, you're over there. You believe this, you believe that. You don't know where you're going. And, that, and that's when I started to see a need for an objective standard by which we can test things to see if they're true or false, good or bad. I saw that you need it. There has to be an objective standard or else you will never, ever be able to determine what the truth actually is. And guess what? The Bible, the Word of God says that it is that objective standard show you a couple verses. Second Peter 1 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Okay. So when he says we have a more sure word of prophecy, he's saying he was talking about, you know, hearing God's voice from heaven, whatever. It doesn't matter if you see a vision, you hear a voice, you read something, you read a book, you hear someone say something, no matter what it is. He says we have a more sure word, more trustworthy. And he's talking about the word of God. You could trust it more than anything else, more more trustworthy. And then Jesus said, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? So the Bible says Jesus himself said that the word of God, the Bible, is truth. That is truth. That is the standard for truth. And this is so crucial and important. I got, and trust me, I got some more information about this. To, can I tell you um, about my journey and how I came to be where I am today? Another point is that while studying all these topics, I kept seeing that the Bible was predicting a one world government with the one economic system, just like all these elite keep writing about. Hey, just so happens to say that. And, and I kept seeing that pop up over and over again. So let's look at this. Revelation 13, verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Six, six, six. Six hundred sixty-six. That's what it is. The mark of the beast, right? But... In order for this to be able to happen, that no one can buy or sell except they have the mark of the beast, well, there has to be one world economic system. Maybe with digital currency. 
with internet, with NBIC technology, satellites, whatever it is. One worldwide system. And um, the Bible makes this prediction. And I was like, you know, like I said, I was studying all the, these, these uh, conspiracy topics. And they're all talking about how they want this one world system. Over and over and over again. And, and, and I started saying, well, you know, the Bible and people keep saying that this is going to happen. Uh, the Christian truthers would bring this point up. They keep bringing this point up that, you know, because I listen to other truthers and conspiracy guys that weren't Christians. Listen to all kinds of people. But the Christians were saying, hey, guess what? You know that New World Order they keep talking about? It's talking about in the Bible. That one world system. So the Bible was predicting this. And that made me think that the Bible was more than just a regular book written by man. Because it was predicting that this system would come, this one world system, 2,000 years ago. And the Bible also shows the purpose of this one world system is for the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. All the world will worship him and he gets his power from Satan. Now this is important if you know conspiracy stuff. This also makes sense of why all the high level elites are into Luciferianism and the occult. It is not a game to them, okay? There, some people say that, you know, they look at Bohemian Grove and stuff and they go, oh, they're just, you know, they're just putting on a play, a show. It's all a show. It's not. Okay? You study, if you study this stuff enough, you will know and you will see all the high-level elites are into the occult. They're Luciferians. They're Satanists. 100%. And you got to ask yourself why. Because it's all fake. Because the devil isn't real. They, don't, they worship him for no reason. They serve him. All these people, all over the world, all working towards a similar goal. And we have their writings going back for many, many years. And they're all just, it's all just a game to them. They don't believe it's real. They're not connected to anything. There's nothing beyond your five senses. That's what you want to tell yourself. Well, the Bible says, guess what? This one world government isn't just for them to, to sit there and control and have total dominion. No, it's for the Antichrist. It is for Satan. 100%. I'm going to show you where it says that in the Bible. Check this out. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And all the world wandered after the beast. That's the Antichrist. All the world. And they worshipped the dragon... The dragon is the devil. Because another place in the Bible, you might say, okay, well, why is it using the, the name dragon? It's just the title of, of the devil. To, and it explains and defines it. That's what the Bible does. It defines a symbol, okay? And it says in another place in the book of Revelation that the dragon is the devil, okay? And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, okay? So Satan gives power to the Antichrist. And it says they worship the devil and the Antichrist. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's what people are going to say in the future. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He's going to blaspheme God, blaspheme Jesus Christ. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. Talk trash about God. Say bad things. Very, very bad things and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints against the Christians, overcome them. The power was given unto him over kindreds, tongues, all kindred tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? So it says, everyone in the world will worship the beast, the Antichrist, if their name's not written in the book of life. Okay? And so again, it talks about this one world system, but it's built for this. The main purpose of it is for the one world religion of worshiping the beast and the devil. And that explains why they're all into that. And they, and if you look at it, you study all the stuff. Look at how they put all the symbolism in everything. You know if you, stu you, know if you studied all the symbolism hidden in, in um, movies, in Hollywood and music and everything. All the 666 and the all-seeing eye and 
upside down crosses and satanic stuff it's everywhere they put it everywhere why to prepare you for this prepare people for this all the stories about that the, the hero's journey the man that comes to save everything the superheroes it's all preparing the world for this beast but the, all their writings and so I saw this prediction right the Bible this was further confirmation to me of the truth of the Bible it was describing and predicting the conspiracy and making more sense out of it than anything else more than made more sense than anything else that I, I, I read or anyone heard anyone say nothing else made any sense like the new agers and or atheists or anyone else who talked about this stuff this is the only thing that made sense about why all this is happening why is the, why are all these why is there all this conspiracy what is it what is it all heading towards well the Bible tells you plain as day so I had all that knowledge and I was thinking about the truth of these things but as I was studying God showed me my biggest problem rebellion okay and this is very important extremely important in fact it's the most important thing that I'm gonna say today I studied and studied and studied so much I overdosed on red pills I studied so my eyes are bleeding okay like I said documentaries and books and lectures and everything that I could get my hands on and I filled my head with knowledge about all this stuff I knew every conspiracy you could think of all about secret societies and conspiracies and the new world order everything connected to it but I was still in rebellion living in rebellion against God I still loved my sin and didn't want it I didn't want to let it go did not want to let my sin go I wanted to profess to be a Christian and know about all this truth but still do what I want and live a life of sin and that was the fact that was the fact I knew all this stuff 2005 2006 2007 2008 first part of 2009 I knew all this stuff but I was living a life of sin doing whatever I wanted living in rebellion against God even though I knew all this stuff I was living a life of sin drunkenness anger filthy language I mean you just go down the list all, all kinds of sin I was a death metal singer filled with anger that whole time all the way till 2009 screaming and you know the, in reading about a lot of this stuff honestly made me fuel the anger in fact before I recorded uh, the last album that I recorded I watched an Alex Jones documentary before I went into the studio to get hyped up and, and angry about all the bad stuff because it made me so angry as I studied the Bible some more, there were some verses God used to convict me of my sin. Okay, I'm going to show you some of these verses. And these are some of the verses that God used to um, convict me of all the sin that I was living, that I was loving, I was living my own way, and just really showing me the importance of this. All right, so I'm going to show you some of these verses and I'll talk about it after. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein now this is especially applies this especially applies to someone who says they're a Christian because people who say oh you know we're I'm a Christian I'm saved by grace it's all about grace but in Romans 6 it says yeah but you know just cuz you, you you have grace does that mean you can continue in sin continue to live a life of sin God forbid no you can't you're supposed to be dead to sin you're not supposed to live in sin let's look at more a little bit more from Romans 6 Romans chapter 6 verse 15 what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace that's another thing that people say well we're not under the law right when it isn't the Old Testament as if there's no commandments no sin like sin doesn't even exist it doesn't matter if you sin it's crazy 
But meanwhile, the same person, if you lied to them, hurt them, they would be upset. Well, guess what? That's sin. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. No. We should not. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Okay, if you yield yourself unto sin, you're the servant of sin. It actually says uh, another place in the Bible, he that committed sin is the servant of sin. You're a slave to sin. You're a bondage to sin. Sin is your master. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from that heart, from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So he's saying, if you really are a Christian, then you're not a servant of sin anymore. You were in the past. But now, if you're a Christian, you're, you're made free from it. Okay, so just talking about living in sin, right? Here's another one. 1 John 2, 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I mean, man, this is really plain, right? But if you say you know him, you're saying, I know God, I know Jesus, I'm a Christian, and keepeth not his commandments, you don't care about obeying God, you don't care about living in sin, well, the Bible says you're a liar. Truth's not in you. You're a liar. You're not a Christian. You say, I know Jesus, but you li people put that in their social media profile. Follower of Jesus. A lot of times, <laughs> I've found a lot of times people who put that follower of Jesus, they're just living a life of sin. It's, it's an excuse. But he says, if you say that, and you live in sin, you're a liar. You're not a Christian. The Bible's plain. Here's another one. Jesus himself said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Very short, but very powerful. You know, a lot of people say that. I'm a Christian. Oh, I love Jesus. I follow Jesus. I'm an imperfect follower of Christ. Well, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. You know what that means? Let's say the opposite. If you don't love Jesus, you won't keep his commandments. That's hard to hear, isn't it? But it's true. If you say you're a Christian, yet you don't strive to obey Christ, obey the Word of God, you don't love Jesus. That's just a fact. You don't love God. You don't. So don't say that you do. Because this is the truth. And I got one more passage for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. This will really make it very plain about, about sin, living a life of sin. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, won't go to heaven. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay? So basically what this is saying is, you know, the unrighteous. And then it lists all these sins, right? Fornication, uh, you know, sex outside of marriage, idolaters. You worship any other God. You follow anyone else except Jesus Christ. Adultery. Uh, you know what that is? Effeminate. That's even LGBT. Abuses of themselves and mankind. That's what that is. Thieves, covetous. You want something that you don't have. Think it'll make you happy. Drunkards. Revilers. Are you mean and nasty? Talk a lot of trash about people, talk trash about them, or talk down to them. That's a reviler. Someone says something nasty, I'm going to be nasty back to them. Okay? These are all sins. You're in there somewhere. That, you know, there's lying. The Bible says liars have their part in the lake of fire. doesn't matter what you, your sin is. Jesus even said, every idle word that men shall speak shall come into account thereof in the day of judgment. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Let no filthy communication proceed out of your mouth. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It says the thought of foolishness is sin. It says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. There's a lot of sins you can do in thought, word, and deed. And there's a lot of sins that you have done. You know what the Bible says? The unrighteous shall not 
inherit the kingdom of God will not go to heaven if you are any of these sins. That's how you live. Let me tell you what happened to me. I was convicted by this because I was living in sin. Then one day I was so convicted that I couldn't continue anymore without repenting. I knelt beside my bed, wept over my sin against God. I turned to Jesus Christ and he saved me. I, I saw myself as a wicked, lost sinner on my way to hell. I was, a, a, like I said, I was a death metal singer filled with anger and hate, drunkenness, drugs, all, whatever, a bunch of sins. And I was reading, you know, I've been reading some of these verses and stuff and they were convicting. But then I was reading some other book and it listed a bunch of sins saying you should repent of these things. Melt down besides, beside the bed. I couldn't even barely get the first word out before I started weeping over my sin. God broke my heart. God broke my heart. You know, the Bible says Jesus came to heal the broken heart. Not the stony hearted. Don't harden your heart. Don't get start getting proud and, and, and thinking that you're this isn't you. You think you're better than this. Okay, this is what happened to me. So, there's nothing wrong with being red pilled. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. We don't. I, I'm not saying, oh yeah, go bury your head in, in the sand to be brainwashed. No, that's garbage. I'm not saying that. That's stupid. I'm not saying that. But you don't want to be red-pilled and lost. You can know about every single deception in the world and still lose your soul in the end. Look at this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Is it worth it? Will it be worth it? Jesus said in Matthew eighteen eleven, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. That which was lost. And you could be red-pilled, yet lost. And the good news is, if you recognize and confess that you are lost, then that is the best place you can be in. Okay? And you do. You need, First of all, you need to, you know, the Bible says there is a danger with knowledge. It says knowledge puffeth up, right? It puffs you up with pride. You think you're better than everyone else. I'm so much better than all the other sheeple because I know all the secrets. And I've studied all this secret knowledge. And I know the truth about what really goes on in the world. And look at all these brainwashed zombies. And you think you're better than everyone. But guess what? God says there is none righteous. No, not one. There's no such thing as a good person, not on the face of the earth. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned, including you. No matter how much truth you know, no matter how red-pilled you are, you're still a sinner. And you need to see that. You see yourself as a sinner, that you see all that sin that you've sinned against a righteous and holy God and that you're lost, that's the best place to be in. That's the bad news you need before the good news. You can't come to the good news. You can't hear that you because you won't appreciate it, and appreciate it until you hear the bad news first, which is the truth. You want the ultimate truth? This is the truth. Okay? Is that you have sinned against a righteous and holy God you have broken his laws, his commandments, and that since God is a God of justice, he must punish sin, and therefore he must punish you. Everyone everyone that has sinned, he must punish, or else he'd be an unjust judge. Imagine if God just forgave all the serial killers, evil dictators throughout history, like Stalin, and oh yeah, I just go to heaven. I'm just a loving God. Forgive, I just forgive you. No. You want, a, you want a just God, just like an earthly judge. If someone, you know, uh, there was a murder and you murdered a member of your family, you're sitting in the courtroom and the court and the judge says, "Hey, since I'm a you know loving judge, 
I'm going to let this murder off the hook. And, and you would be so, you'd be furious. How could you let this guy off the hook? He killed my family member. Oh, it's because of my love. That's not love. What about love for the victim's family? What about justice? See, in this earth, we'll cry for justice. We'll demand it. But with God, when God's dealing with us and our sin, we don't want it. Oh, no, we don't want that. Oh, God, we want it. But, oh, oh if we do, it's only for the murderers and the thieves and the rapists and the pedophiles. It, yeah, it's okay, God, judge them. But we don't want God to judge the liars, the drunkards, the fornicators, which is us. Every, every person. That's you. And so, you see, you do want God to be a God of justice. And if God was just, in, which he is, and you have sinned, which you have, then the only just thing to do is for your life of sin and rebellion over and over and over again, all day, every day, breaking his commandments and completely living in rebellion against God. The only uh, just thing to do is to punish you. And the Bible says that's hell. And we all deserve it. Now, thanks be to God, he's not just a God of justice, he's also a God of love, mercy, and forgiveness. And that love doesn't contradict or cancel out that justice. So he wants to forgive. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God wants them to be saved. Problem is, he can't forgive you without being unjust. And that's why Jesus Christ came. He solves that problem between love and justice. He solves it. That's why it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Because if he just left it where it was at and didn't send Jesus Christ, he would be totally justified in just sending all the sinners to hell. But since he d does love, th he showed an act of love, didn't want, the, didn't want to do that. See, the Bible says God is love. He sent Jesus Christ to live a life, uh, a sinless life. And then he died on the cross and he took the punishment for our sins. He took our sin. It says, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took all of our sin. And it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. God poured out his wrath on Jesus in our place, in your place. You see, you deserve that punishment, but he took it. And that is an act of love, the greatest act of love that has ever happened and ever will in history. And then he rose again the third day, conquered death, right? And now God tells you this, okay? I'm going to wrap it up and, and tell you very simply. Uh, I told you what he did. He solved the problem of the inter he showed the intersection of God's justice and mercy in Jesus Christ. And he says, repent and believe the gospel. That's as simple as you can put it. Now to explain that, Jesus emphasized that. He said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He said, repent or perish. Either you repent or you're going to go to hell. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says it over and over again. Well, what does that mean? Well, first part of it is what I told you. You have to humble yourself, not be puffed up with pride, not say, yeah, I'm a good person. Not think that, oh, I could, you know, get to heaven because I've done a bunch of good things. No, the Bible says absolutely not. It says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Not of works. You cannot cover up your sin or pay for your sin by anything good you've done. The Bible is clear about that. Okay? So, part of repentance is recognizing that you're lost, a lost sinner that deserves hell, and that you can't save yourself, that you're not a good person, and your good works can't cover up your sin. Recognizing that, admitting that, being sorry for that sin against God, hating it, and wanting to turn from that sin in your heart, 
turn your back on a light, that life of sin and rebellion, saying, I hate it. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to live that life anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to rebel against God anymore. I don't want to live that life. And so you turn your back on it in your heart. And you don't just turn your back on it. You turn to Jesus Christ. And you put your faith in him and what he did. Now that is what saves you, is faith in Christ. And let me give you a couple verses of that to explain that. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith. And that not of yourselves. It's not what you do. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of works. It's a gift. You're saved by grace through faith. Faith in Christ. Okay? Jesus said he's the only way. I am the tr way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus himself said, I am the truth. You say you've been looking for the truth, and you've got truth bombs and red pills. Well, Jesus said, I am the truth. He's the truth you should be looking for. And you find it and you say, I finally found it. The truth, Jesus Christ. And you can finally rest. He said, come unto me and I will give you rest. The Bible says he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. That's what he did for you. And so, you... It says repentance towards God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 21. So you repent. You turn to Jesus Christ. You put your faith in Him. You believe what He did. And you, you ask Him to save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Say, say God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Why don't you drop to your knees and, and, and be sorry for your life of sin. Repent. As I said in the beginning, simply repent and believe the gospel. Repent and turn to Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Him. He's the only one that can save you. He can, he's the only one that can wash away your sins. His blood will wash you clean. You are, because of your sin, you are dirty, filthy. But the Bible says, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sins. You can be forgiven of your sins. Through that gift of salvation. That is the most important thing you could ever do. And you will be born again at that time. That's what You never heard that phrase before? Jesus said you must be born again. You must. And that's how you're born again. If you repent and believe the gospel, put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're born again at that moment. Not by getting baptized in water. You should do that after you're saved. But when you get saved, you're born again in that moment. It's a supernatural transformation where God gives you a new heart with new desires. No longer will you want to live that life of sin, but you want to live a life pleasing to God. You'll want to read the Bible, pray, tell people about Jesus. Those th you, everything will be changed. You'll be supernaturally transformed into a new person. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what it means to be saved, to be born again. And that's what I want for you, and that's the ultimate red pill. And if you don't have that, you got nothing. You can be as red-pilled as you want. Be the most red-pilled pill, person in the world. But if you're, if you're lost, it's not worth it in the end. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So I urge you to repent, turn to Jesus Christ, put your faith in Him and be saved today because that's the most important thing. No matter how red-pilled you are, that's not going to save you. You could be red pilled but lost. If you want more information about that, I got some other messages. You can watch Truth in an Age of Confusion, How to Know the Truth and Be Saved. Another one is the Gospel from Genesis to Revelation. Check those ones out.
and you can have more explanation about these types of things. But that's the most important thing I could tell you. I told you how it happened with me. I want the same for you. That's why I made this video for the red pilled people out there. Please listen to this message and spread it with as many people as you can. Because people need to know that you can be in a dangerous place to be red pilled but lost. And warn them to flee from the wrath to come before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you for, for listening and watching. Please like, share, subscribe. Check all the links below. Uh, it really helps out. God bless you. Have a good day.